and welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports Network. That's Danny Cannell. That's Bud Elliott. That's Tom Fernelli. I'm Chip Patterson. Happy to get you set for the week ahead in the Big Ten. That will include a big game breakdown. So we take a look at Penn State hosting Illinois, one of its toughest games of the season for James Franklin's Nittany Lions. We'll, of course, be looking at that big time game on CBS as Wisconsin heads out to the Coliseum to go face USC. Uh, fresh off the Trojans thriller, but disappointing finish in Ann Arbor against Michigan. Uh, all that and so much more. But gentlemen, I thought we'd start with the game. Why not, right? Let's have a little fun out here. And this game is called Name the Loss. And so we've all submitted our answers because there are six teams in the Big Ten that have yet to take a loss in the 2024 season. And so we are going to try to figure out if we can pinpoint exactly when these teams will take a loss if they will at all. That last piece, of course, being relevant as we get started with the Ohio State Buckeyes. All right, Striker, let's see it. Where are we going? A brrr, whoa, okay. All right, we got a chip with Penn State, Danny with Oregon, Tom Penn State, but Bud Elliott with no one. So what better way to get started as we look at Ohio State? Bud, it's UC 12-0. Um, what's what's the path look like and what gives you confidence that the Buckeyes are going to be able to navigate this one with the zero in the loss column? Sure, Chip. Well, Ohio State is staying healthy and a lot of the teams they play are not staying super healthy. We just saw the news last night that Oregon guard Matthew Bedford has been re-injured during the bye week. That was a key piece for the Ducks that I was counting on them getting back if they were going to challenge Ohio State here when, when Ohio State heads to Oregon in a couple of weeks. So that one kind of a big deal to me. Penn State also lost one of their best safeties. So to me, Ohio State was the best team in this conference entering the season. They have stayed healthier than their closest challengers. And I think they still got a lot of cards held close to the vest, and we'll kind of see if they can play them. But right now, Ohio State's doing kind of what Michigan did last year, which was show absolutely nothing in these cupcake non-conference games that they're playing. And I think they can unleash quite a bit on Oregon coming up. Ooh. So, Danny, yeah. when you were looking at the Oregon game, is is a little bit some because I, I will say like when I picked Penn State, I was definitely selecting Penn State with the Ohio State is not unbeatable. I mean, I'm not going to overreact to, you know, a slow start against Marshall, but I certainly have not been like blown away by just the scores on the scoreboard. Um, when you looked at that Oregon spot, is that an Ohio State based or Oregon based or maybe a little bit of both? Both. Absolutely both. There's also a little preseason bias in there as well, as that's a game I've had circled, you know, for we've all had it circled for six, eight months leading up to this point is one of the games of the year. I think there's value in getting tested. Oregon's been tested a couple times. Yes, against lesser opponents. Boise State comes to mind, but Boise State right now is the favorite uh, to make it as the group of five team, who, well, most likely the Mountain West champ. So I don't think that that game, as close as it was, is as bad as it looks. Then they go to Corvallis, answer, respond there against uh, a, a you know pretty feisty Oregon State team. And I don't think we've seen Ohio State tested yet. To Bud's point, we might not, and they might be able to hide everything. But what happens when it's crunch time, specifically for Will Howard on the road? One thing I've learned this year about college football, there's more parity than we think. And I think that includes even the top, as evidenced by Georgia almost getting knocked off by Kentucky. All right, well, now let's go to those Oregon Ducks. All right, let's see. What did everybody pick? Okay. All right, so uh, Chip's got Ohio State going into Autzen. Uh, Oregon falling at Michigan is what Danny's got. Ohio State is, again, Bud's pick and Ohio State's Tom's pick. Danny, you got Michigan yep. there, so I guess if they're going to get through uh, Ohio State, uh, you think that Michigan, you, you were there in Ann Arbor, you think they've got the goods to take down the Ducks? So look at what happened last year with uh, Dan Lanning getting beat twice by Washington. They have struggled with some of the more physical teams that they have faced. And so this is almost one of those ones where I don't think anybody runs the table. It kind of goes back to the parody that nobody seems unbeatable. And since I had already had them beating Ohio State, it's like, all right, well, where's there another potential loss? And I had it on the road at Michigan, a place we just saw USC struggle to go into. And with the new offensive approach that Michigan has, I think they're going to challenge Oregon and they're going to say, good luck trying to stop us. We're going to try to cram it down your throat. I would hope that the pass game evolves to maybe you don't see 300-yard games, 
but maybe you could see 132 yards passing instead of 32. And I think that's a physical challenge for the Ducks to respond to. And this Michigan defense, I think, is only going to continue to get better. Yeah, I think it's going to come when they host Ohio State and Autzen Stadium because I do believe Ohio State will definitely throw for more than 32 yards in that game. Yes. But for me, the reason I'm making the I, – I think this is the pick is before the season, I had Oregon winning this game. And even though Ohio State hasn't really played anybody, they've been far and away more impressive to me overall than from what I have seen of the Ducks who struggled in their first two games and got things together against Oregon State as they got healthier on the offensive line. But I still don't think they look incredible up front. And I look at that Ohio State defensive front that they'll be facing. I think it could cause a lot of problems for them, even at home. So right now, based on what I'm seeing, I think Ohio State wins that game. All right. Now let's go to Penn State. Again, they had an early off week. Uh, they have no losses, but okay, okay, okay. So they do have a trip out to Los Angeles. That's where Chip and Danny is gone. Tom as well. Bud's going to go with Ohio State. So you've got this uh, this going for a little bit longer and deeper into the season, Bud. Now we are going to do a big game breakdown for Penn State, Illinois. But uh, I guess, what, Bud, what has your attention about Penn State and the ability to get through the rest of the Nittany Lions schedule to that point. Sure. Well, I, I have max confidence that Penn State is going to be able to score points against most everybody they, they, they face. I think they'll be able to score some points against Illinois this weekend. You know, UCLA does not look like, look like a Dante challenge. They'll probably need to score some points, by the way, against USC. A USC team that I know you all picked for this, and I, I, I thought about it, I'm not going to lie. Like That's a pretty good pick. But I, I also kind of think like that USC game is more of an island game because it's now a sandwich between UCLA and Wisconsin, who I really don't think are threats to beat this Penn State team based on how UCLA and Wisconsin are underperforming so far this year. So I think they can get through that, UC, uh, that USC game. But man, that Ohio State game, that is tough for me, right? Like defensively, I think Ohio State matches up really well. And I think Ohio State can score on them. I think Ohio State's going to go undefeated. So give me the bucks. Yeah, we do have some of our like win totals problems when we do these exercises. Like you commit to something, then everything needs to add up because because we're men of integrity, y'all. Okay. All right. I, so I've obviously selected um, this USC game. I think that there's a a way that you could come out of the the Michigan loss and only be more encouraged about how USC is going to fit into the Big Ten, how USC can compete with some of these traditional powers, and the idea that a league that has had that top tier, you know, very much cemented over the last several years might need to make a little room uh, for the Trojans as they step in there. So making a a big trip out west uh, as you have, you know, these sort of big games all around it for Penn State, that, I think that's a spot where USC, I, right now as we sit here today, I'm, I would pick USC to win straight up. So that's where I think Penn State would pick up its first loss. Now, Rutgers has been, you know, getting started every single year with a couple wins, you know, 3-0 and each of the last four years. And now Rutgers is going to try to keep this thing rolling, get a little bit better each and every year. So who will hand Rutgers its first loss? Oh, baby. Clean sweep. Everybody's got Nebraska. Danny, what's it, it? Was this easy for you? Like as you went through the Rutgers schedule, is was it pretty easy to circle Nebraska and say that's the most obvious spot? Yes, because it was really hard for me to start looking at a potentially 10 and two Rutgers team. So I'm sitting there thinking <laughs> there's no way that could be the case. Let me try to find games they could potentially lose. And I went to a road game. We saw Lincoln, Nebraska, the type of scene that it was against Illinois. And I know they came up short, but I still think Dylan Riola is going to get more comfortable. I think he's got enough athleticism. He's going to continue to develop. And I also wonder where Rutgers is going to be like when they have to travel on the road. And they did look impressive versus Virginia Tech. But I think this Nebraska team is better um, or excuse me, this Nebraska, yes, is better than Virginia Tech. I think they win at home against Washington. I think that's their first hiccup. So it was kind of like, I don't like, clearly there were some obvious ones, USC on the road, but I just have a hard time envisioning them being 10 and two. So it's like, all right, let me find their first road game. that's going to be challenging. I went with that one, but they have been really strong so far. And it was reason why Greg Schiano was so bullish on his team coming into the season. 
Yeah, sneaky sub headline of this exercise is all of us being on board with Rutgers beating Washington this week, a game that has a somewhat tight point spread. Um, so very interesting to keep our eyes on that one as the week goes on. Again, if any one of us want to jump out and throw all of our confidence behind it, tune in for the locks episode on Thursdays. We're live at 11 a.m. Eastern time. OK, the Illinois fighting Illini 4-0. They got two ranked wins already. Who will take down the Illini? Who we got? Oh, baby, it's another clean sweep. Tom, it, it, did it bring you pain to to come to this justification? I mean, they're a huge, they're a three-score underdog in the game. Did you think about looking even further down the schedule here? Throwing to me to describe why Illinois is going to lose a football game. <laughs> Cold world, Chip. That's just mean. Um, I mean, listen, Illinois has two big wins already this season, picking up the win against Kansas, going on the road to beat Nebraska last week. And, but going on the road two straight weeks against two good teams and expecting to win both is a tough chore for anybody. And while, you know, maybe a little little peek at the future at the locks pot on Thursday, I think the 17 and a half point spreads a little big. But I don't think that Illinois is going to be able to go on the road and do it two weeks in a row against the Penn State team that, frankly, has looked very good to start the season. The offense has been explosive both through the air and on the ground. Defensively, they are a solid unit. So as good as I think this Illinois team is, and as much as I just wanted to say they weren't going to lose a single game all year, I think the reality is there's a good chance that they lose this week at Penn State. All right, and now uh, let's round it out. Rock me, mama. Here we go. The Indiana Hoosiers. Where did everybody go with the, okay, all right, I'm standing on an island, but, bud, you've got first word. Uh, as you look at the Hoosier schedule, you see Nebraska as the most likely spot where they slip up? Chip, I do. So th they really haven't played anybody with a pulse along the lines of scrimmage so far, right? FIU, terrible along the lines of scrimmage. Western Illinois, ditto. UCLA, ditto. Charlotte, ditto. I, I think they can probably skate past Maryland this week and all that. That's a bit of a tight point spread, too. Less than a touchdown there in Bloomington. Northwestern right now looks like maybe the worst team in the Power Five. Purdue might give them a run for their money there. But Nebraska has actual physicality on both sides of the line of scrimmage, and they have some real athletes. I trust Indiana's offense, but I'm not sure that I really trust Indiana's defensive numbers so far. I think some of those defensive numbers are more of a result of offensive incompetent from the opponents they've played so far. So give me Nebraska to go into Bloomington. So obviously by selecting Michigan, that means I've got 9-0 and Hoosiers on the brain, which means I, I, I'm just lost in the sauce. But however, this is a group that is still learning, right? Learning how to win is something that takes steps. And when you look at the schedule, that trip to Bloomington – not exactly a house of horrors for most of the Big Ten. It is coming out of an off week with Ohio State on deck. I mean, that's that's a trap. That is a trap spot. So I went a little bit further uh, for Indiana. That's why I've got Michigan selected. Uh, this I, I just think that this uh, I think this group can keep on rolling the rest of the way. Well, coming up on the other side, we start to take a look at one of the biggest games in the Big Ten this weekend. It is Illinois traveling to Happy Valley to take on Penn State in prime time. We'll break it down. Next. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast live on CBS Sports Network. Every single week, we like to take this middle portion of the week to dig into the matchups. Our locks will come on Thursday, but Tuesdays, Wednesdays, that's for letting you know what to keep your eye on going into the biggest games of the week. And so for the Big Ten, it doesn't get a whole lot bigger than Penn State hosting Illinois. So Penn State, a team that we expected to be one of the top teams in the conference, really hasn't given us a lot. They've only played three games. They've only played you know, the opener at West Virginia that I feel like I can take a lot of data from. Um, but well, what do we know about Penn State as best as you can tell? Who are the Nittany Lions heading into Big Ten play? Sure. So, Chip, two things we know about Penn State. One, they still have a really nasty front step, and I, I think those guys can rip off the edge. They can be really disruptive. And offensively, Penn State seems to have adapted and picked up to this Andy Kotelnicki offense in year one 
almost immediately. Now, West Virginia is not great along the lines of scrimmage, so there is still some question there about Penn State. How good are they against a good defensive front, right? But against average or below average defensive front, Penn State is able to score the number of points that I think you would expect a good offense to score. Like the offense seems reliable for 30 plus against all the defenses that are not like really good defenses. Yeah, I totally agree. Like they've given you everything we thought we were going to get with Colton Nicky taking over. They've been more explosive. They're averaging 12 yards per attempt. Like they've, we've seen, you know, uh, Drew Aller kind of emerge in this offense. Um, where he's been really solid, very accurate, 70% completion percentage thrower, eight touchdowns, only the one interception. I think it's great that Nick Singleton feels like he's kind of back after a less than stellar year last year. But I do think there is a but in there because I do think when you look at West Virginia, kind of what's transpired since then, maybe not quite as imposing. It still was a good win for Penn State. But I'd also, the one thing that kind of is is interesting to me is there's really – I'm still wondering who the wide receiver is that's going to step out. I mean, mm. they do have Tyler Warren is still the leading receiver as a tight end. We saw um, Harrison Wallace have the breakout game against West Virginia. We haven't seen Julian Fleming be quite the the weapon that we thought maybe he was going to be at wide receiver. So, like, who is the wide receiver one, the guy that's going to be the dude for Penn State that you can go to when you need that big play? still think that's a little bit of a question mark, but – I think by all signs, like you should be positive and there should be all, you know, by all accounts, it's been good for Penn State, but this will be a really nice test for them. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think this is the game where we finally actually get an idea of what this Penn State team is because I, I they beat West Virginia in that opener. It was a weird game. They had the long weather delay, but I don't particularly think West Virginia is a very good team, like Bud mentioned, especially on the lines of scrimmage compared to Penn State. Last week, they played the decaying husk currently called Kent State football. So I'm not sure what, if anything, we could take away from that game. And we also saw them play Bowling Green, who did give them some trouble. So this is far and away the best team that Penn State will have faced to this point in the season. It's definitely the best team they faced along the lines of scrimmage. So what's going to be curious to me is, can we see this team maintain the kind of explosive play right that they have shown through those first three games? Because, Bud, you mentioned it. Andy Kotelnicki has come in, and this offense has taken off. Last season, there were no big plays in the Penn State offense. This season, they're currently ranked second nationally in explosive pass rate at 30.4%. So a third of their passes are going for big chunk yards. They're ninth on the ground in explosive play rate. Are they going to be able to maintain that against an Illinois defense that has been very opportunistic and has done a decent job containing explosives, but has done a spectacular job of forcing turnovers? So that, to me, for this matchup is going to be huge. How good can that Penn State offense perform against this Illinois defense? Tom, from that, um, from, from sort of that side of the matchup to the, to the other, where there is not a single quarterback in the Big Ten that has a better touchdown interception ratio than Illinois quarterback Luke Altmaier because that's 10 touchdowns to zero interceptions. Uh, what have you seen from Altmaier that's impressed you with the jump from last season to this season? And what are going to be the keys going up against a Penn State secondary that is dealing with some injury issues as well? Yeah, I, I think this is one of those situations where you see quarterbacks transfer and then the first year they're kind of okay, but then their second year in the system at a new school, they blossom, they learn the playbook, they have a better understanding of what they're trying to do and their confidence grows. And I think you have seen that with Luke Altmaier in this Illinois offense, which has been very good throwing the ball and passing it through the air. And that is the one thing I think you're going to have to look at in this matchup, because as I mentioned earlier, Penn State's defense did struggle a bit against the Bowling Green passing attack, and no offense to Connor Basilak and the boys in orange and brown, they're not quite where Illinois is with Altmaier, Zakari Franklin, and Pat Bryant. So how will they look? I have seen a little bit of coverage issues in that secondary. I think Jalen Reed and A.J. Harris are playing well. Zaki Wheatley and Jalen Kimber kind of having some problems. Now Wheatley's been in there because of the injury to K.J. Winston Jr., but as good as K.J. Winston Jr. has been, He's been more of a run defender than somebody I look at as a coverage mm. guy. So as far as that aspect of the meeting goes, I'm not sure it's a huge loss, but that is another interesting thing where if I'm Illinois, what we have seen them do particularly well, even though the passing game has been better, they've got four running backs. Two of them are huge. Two of them are the shiftier, you know, quick guys. 
They rotate them in and out, and they just wear on teams as the game goes along. We saw them do it to Nebraska. We saw them do it to Kansas. They're going to try to do it to Penn State. It's going to be far more difficult to do so because Penn State has a terrific front seven. But with K.J. Winston not playing, is that something Illinois can exploit to finally get that run game going to where even earlier in the game they're having more success on the ground than they do in the fourth quarter? So that's going to be another key spot to watch, in my opinion. I kind of think both sides will score a good bit of points here, Tom. Illinois, I have pretty good confidence that they're at least going to get to, what, 17, low 20s. It it just seems like they're so competent on offense. They have a couple guys who are real players on the outside. They've clearly hit in the transfer portal at a high rate with this offensive line. You know, something, I think they were the beneficiary of Oklahoma picking some of the wrong guys in the transfer portal. And Illinois is like, cool, I'll take the guys you didn't want because they're better than the guys you did take, as we talked about on the Monday show. On the other side, maybe this is unjustified. I'm still a little bit skeptical of the Illinois defensive line. It's better than I thought, Mm. but how much better? And I I think Penn State does have potentially the opportunity to push around Illinois up front. And to me, like Penn State has touchdown scores at all of the non-receiver positions. Singleton and Allen, especially Singleton, if he gets schemed open, if if you mess up one of your rotations against the motion and shift of this end code Nicky offense, you don't get a second bite at that apple because that dude is gone. Tyler Warren, I don't think he's better than Michigan's Colson Loveland, but guys, he's not that far off, in my opinion. Harrison Wallace is a pretty nice receiver for them. He, he had some nice plays against West Virginia. Like To me, can they prevent those explosive plays from Penn State? Because that is really what Penn State has been so good at this year. They just they hit 30 and 40 and 50 yarders routinely. Uh, we've talked a lot about Andy Colton, Nikki, the Penn State offensive coordinator. Barry Lunny Jr. has done a phenomenal mm. job at Illinois, too, putting Luke Altmyer in really good positions. And they've had some outstanding play calls up front where it's taken some of the pressure off the offensive line. And I think that's what just going back to what Tom said about where, you know, where did this Luke Altmyer come from? There is value in knowing where to go with the football and where to go with it quickly, which can really assist your offensive line. And sometimes that going quickly might even be a throwaway, just getting rid of it. But he has really gotten rid of the ball quickly. It's come out of his hands. He's making quick decisions, which I think he's going to have to do in this game against this Penn State front. I think that coordinator versus Tom Allen, that matchup, the uh, Illinois offensive coordinator versus the Penn State defensive coordinator is a matchup that probably will determine the outcome of this game. Because if Illinois can do what they did on the road in Lincoln against a much tougher team, keep them in the game, keep it competitive, and that pressure starts to build on Penn State at home. Yeah, tough. Tom, uh, didn't tough they task. score 48 last year on this on Tom Allen's Indiana defense? Uh, they, they did put up a lot. And also, I will mention last year, talking about Luke Altmyer in the Penn State game, he threw four interceptions. It was his worst game with the Illini last season. It's been the worst game of his career. Illinois still kind of hung around in that game and had a chance to win until late. So that is another thing to keep in mind going to Happy Valley this weekend. All right, quick leans. Tom, what do you, how do you think this plays out? Uh, what, do you, what are you sniffing at when it comes to a pick here? As you so cruelly made me say earlier in the show, I do think Penn State ends up winning this game far more often than not. But I also suspect, like Bud, you're saying you think it's going to be higher scoring. I do think it'll be more shootout than most people expect. And I think Illinois is going to make it tough. But I just think the Nittany Lions are a little bit better. I think Penn State gets out early, but I think Illinois sneaks in the back door here to push this game over and a Illinois cover. Um, I kind of like Penn State in this one, which means you should put everything you own on Illinois the way my picks have gone this year. So <laughs> that's uh, Danny and I will be picking against each other on CBS Sports HQ shortly. Thrilled to hear that selection. <laughs> that's the point. All right, coming up on the other side, we turn our attention to big time on CBS. Wisconsin had last week off to be able to get resettled after losing their starting quarterback. They head to USC, which doesn't have much time to get resettled after their first loss of the season. Who bounces back better? We'll get into all that and more next. Back here on the Cover 3 Podcast, live on CBS Sports Network. Well, this Saturday, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, that will be your place to find 
Big time on CBS with the Big Ten game on CBS being Wisconsin at USC. Now, the lay of the land is that, uh, obviously, Wisconsin, last time we saw them, it was it was very disappointing. I mean, this is, this is a Badgers team that has lost Tyler Van Dyke due to injury. Uh, this is a Badgers team that, in its big, huge game against Alabama, uh, was not able to be competitive deep into the game. One of the worst losses for Wisconsin's program, dating all the way back to the 24th 14 Big Ten title game. And then for USC, absolute heartbreak. You had a lead late in the game in Ann Arbor. Uh, Michigan goes all the way down the field for the game-winning touchdown. Our own Danny Cannell was on the sideline. Great coverage before the game for CBS Sports, CBS Sports HQ. So, Danny, you were there firsthand. You got to see USC. Um, based on everything you were able to gather since, talk to, you know, where do you think where do you think this USC team is at right now? What are you expecting from the Trojans as now they've got to put the pieces back together with very little time to linger in the loss? Tom and I were just talking on HQ about the performance and how we both kind of feel. I feel the same, and I think Tom said he feels better, but I was already pretty bullish on USC after winning against LSU and where their defense stood and where the physical mindset came in. But I also think we both hit on a mental maturity and a mental toughness mm. that USC showcased in that game, you know, trailing at halftime, looked like it could get ugly, clawed their way back in. Miller Moss had a pick six, puts his team in a position to win the game after that. Um, there's no doubt it was a devastating loss, but I almost feel like as opposed to the season spiraling out of control where they could potentially throw in the towel, a towel, I think this might motivate this team and see just how special of a season this could be. So I feel really good about this USC team coming back focused, looking to put that win in the rear view mirror and looking to take, take it out on a beaten up Wisconsin team. Daniel, I think those are some great points. I am a little more cautious on USC than I was entering the weekend, and it's not necessarily because of what happened in the Michigan game. Michigan game, they got negative game scripted. Michigan's not a team that you want to play from behind because they can continue to run the football. You don't get to get them out of their comfort zones. We know Michigan really can't throw the football uh, right now. But think about who USC has played. Like LSU didn't cover against South Carolina. They didn't cover against mm. UCLA. They looked kind of kind of mid in those games. Right. Utah State lost, I think, by multiple scores to Temple over the weekend. So a couple of these prior USC performances now are a little bit less impressive to me than they were in the moment, because those teams, as, as it turns out, are maybe not quite as good as we thought in the moment. But I still think USC is a damn good football team. They've got a lot of really nice pieces. If you played again, I, I still think I'm going to pick USC to win in the big house, maybe not cover, but like I still think they're a slightly better team than Michigan. I think they're a way better team than Wisconsin. But you're clearly missing the body blow theory. USC is just beating those teams up so badly that it takes them weeks to recover from what they've gotten from them. I, I'm with you, Danny. I do think that like that the win over LSU was surprising because they looked good. They were not expected to win that game to open the season. So I am a little more impressed by what I've seen, or at least a little more heartened by what I saw of USC in that Michigan loss because they got knocked down and they were able to get back up, which is not something that we have seen them do very often in the last few years. Typically you'd knock them down and they just it, they stay on the ground, cover their head and hope for the best. But I think that this is a game where they are going to have the script in their favor against this Wisconsin team. They're at home. Wisconsin is banged up. Wisconsin has not been playing well to begin with. But what I'm interested in, can we see some more explosive plays in this USC passing game? Because we saw Alabama hit a bunch of explosives against this Wisconsin defense, but that's kind of what Alabama has been passing wise. It's like, it's either boom or bust. Jalen Milrose either hitting somebody deep or he's just running for it. And I think that what we've seen so far is USC has been more efficient, I would say, than explosive. And even with the Alabama results outside of it, Western Michigan and South Dakota were able to hit some big passing plays against Wisconsin too. So I'm looking to see, is this the week Kyron Hudson and Zach Branch can get loose in that secondary Roman free for some big plays? Because this is still a Lincoln Riley team. And we've all been focused on the USC defense and the improvements that we have seen. But I would also still like to see all those, you know, 400 yard passing games and those 45 pointers. So I'm, I'm wondering if we get to see our first glimpse at that for the against Wisconsin. Yeah, Tom, I mean, the the Alabama result was not good. The only other things we have is Western Michigan and South Dakota. I mean, there's 
if you're a Wisconsin fan to me, you're grasping. You're you're just hoping on all hope that Braden Locke's going to be able to be there. And there is something to be said for the fact that you know, Braden Locke went into the Alabama game expecting Tyler Van Dyke to be the starting quarterback. You've had a little bit of time. Offensive coordinator Phil Longo has been able to try to get things ready. So I guess uh, to set this up, almost asking for a lean or an expectation or a thought on how this is going to play out, you know, with a big old point spread on the board, like Tom. Do, do you think Wisconsin's got something for the Trojans here? <laughs> they the better answer might they be haven't no. had much all season. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> I think if you're Wisconsin, you kind of want to do what Michigan did last week. You want to just kind of lean on the run game and put them in a situation where you're keeping that USC offense off the field. The question is Michigan was able to get some explosive runs last week against USC. Wisconsin has not had explosive runs all season long. In fact, they rank 125th nationally in explosive run rate. And that was with Tyler Van Dyke. So now that Tyler Van Dyke is out and Braden Locke is in, I don't know how much respect USC is going to have for this Wisconsin passing game with its backup quarterback and a group of receivers who, frankly, outside of Will Pauling, have been extremely underwhelming. So I think if you're the Badgers, you really need to find it on the ground. You've been trying to run all season. You have not been ultra successful. You've stuck to it anyway. Maybe this is the week. We saw Kalel Mullings running guys over in that USC defense. Maybe they're still bruised from last week. Maybe these Wisconsin backs can find a little more lanes and a little more room to run. So that's got to be the approach that the Badgers take. I'm not overly optimistic it's going to work because I do think this USC offense is just a little too good for them, even with that defense, if they keep it close. But there's a chance, just not a great one. I, I agree with Tom. Like, like Braden Locke is not unplayably bad. We, we saw him last year operate the offense at like a not a good level, but he's not horrendous, unplayable backup level. But at the same time, he couldn't beat out Mordecai last year, and they went and got Van Dyke for a reason, even after Van Dyke was legitimately terrible at Miami. So that probably does have some signal, that decision the coaching staff made, that he didn't win either of those quarterback competitions. Does USC show up? Is there a hangover effect from the Michigan game? If USC is focused, they should roll Wisconsin. I, I don't have Wisconsin as a top-half team in the Big Ten right now. To me, they look really below average on, on the defensive side of the ball, on the lines of scrimmage. I still think the secondary is good. I think USC should have a heck of a time running the football against this Wisconsin front. Western Michigan ran it on them. Alabama had no problem running on them. They look kind of small to me. We know they lost Thompson uh, in the preseason, who was one of their best defensive linemen, unfortunately. Uh, if USC has the right focus here, this game shouldn't be close. And that's what I'm looking for, because I want to see USC. They've been a little bit too pass-heavy for my liking, especially when you consider years past. They're, run, uh, they're running the ball at a 36% uh, rush rate, so they are passing the ball all over the yard. Was it 51, 52 attempts versus Michigan? That game, you know, that's not the type of balance. I don't even think Lincoln Riley, who does like to throw the football, wants to see. And something curious I was just thinking about is that, you know, Lincoln Riley's QBs have always been pretty good runners, whether it was Caleb Williams, who had 11 rushing touchdowns last year, 10 rushing touchdowns the season before that, whether it was Jalen Hurts, whether it was Kyler Murray, whether it's Baker Mayfield, they're all pretty mobile quarterbacks. Miller Moss is more of a pocket passer. They need to balance out that rush game to take some of the pressure off him, and this should be the game where they get right. So I'll be curious to see if they can, in fact, establish those running backs, get them going, get a little bit more balance to this offense. Yeah. I, I think that Wisconsin keeping this game close would be a USC problem is the way that I see it right now. And because I'm hopeful in what my initial, you know, instinct and impressions were of the Trojans, uh, then I'm, I'm thinking that USC is going to be able to take care of business and be able to remain in the mix uh, there even after taking a loss to Michigan here in September. Well, coming up on the other side, Two of those teams that have yet to lose this season are just a couple weeks away from a game that we had circled as one of the games of the year. So let's take the temperature in Columbus and Eugene. How are Ohio State and Oregon looking? Looking ahead to that October 12th matchup. We'll get into all that and more next. Back here on the Cover 3 Podcast, live on CBS Sports Network. Well, we are still a few weeks away from that October 12th clash between Ohio State and Oregon. 
But, you know, we're slowly putting the pieces together. These are two teams that we expect to continue to contend for the Big Ten title. And so I thought we could take just a few minutes to sort of get a sense of how these two teams stack up. So, Danny, I'll start with you first. Um, Who do you think has left a bigger impression on you or, or where in this matchup do you think your opinion might have changed since the preseason? I'm definitely more concerned about Oregon because they haven't looked as dominant as Ohio state and the schedule, you know, I, cause I, I'm not that worried about the Boise state game. Aston Genty might be the best running back in the country. He did run all over that defense, but it doesn't bother me that much. And it doesn't bother me. They need a special teams play to fight their way back in it. I thought they rebounded really in a positive way against Oregon state and Corvallis in a rivalry game, dominating that one from start to finish. And I also think Dylan Gabriel is giving you exactly what we thought we would, maybe then some, but completing 84% of his passes, which is what I thought he would challenge in Bo Nick's completion percentage record. So I look at them and I, I, I actually appreciate that they have been tested and that they have had to dig deep and they have had some gut checks and they haven't lost the game. Um, I think their offensive line is still very much a work in progress. I think I'd like to see more explosive plays out of the receiver. I'd like to see Dylan Gabriel stretch the field vertically a little bit more. But like Ohio State, we haven't seen anything out of them because we haven't seen them tested. So I feel like I know more about Oregon and their resolve and their ability to win some tough games where I think Ohio State has been everything is advertised and maybe then some blowing out these opponents, but the opponents really have been subpar. So I feel like I'm left wondering, all right, is Ohio State going to be that team that just runs through everybody because they haven't played anyone? Or in their first true road test, are we going to find out what the Buckeyes really are made of? I think Danny hit the nail on the head there. I, I have real concerns about Oregon's ability to block Ohio State in that matchup. Uh, I think all of us realize that Gabriel was a downgrade from Bo Nix, both in terms of arm strength and athleticism. Yes, he's still accurate, but he is a more limited player. If he wasn't, he would have just gone to the draft, right? And, and Bo Nix physically is a much more gifted guy. Uh, but some concerning areas for Oregon, a team that I'm still very high on, they have not had a bigger bodied receiver step forward to this point. They need somebody who can win contested catches. They have two really fast, shifty guys, obviously, but they need that bigger guy. And I, if they have to be just pure drop back all the time against Ohio State because they cannot run the football on the Buckeyes, then I feel great about my pick of Ohio State going in there getting that win. Danny, you say you're not that bothered by Ashton Genty running all over the Oregon defense and you don't think that will be a problem against Quinshawn Judkins and Trevion <laughs> Henderson because I, I do I I am a little bit concerned about what I saw in that game from the Ducks defensively and I am concerned with what that offensive line which has been banged up is getting healthier but is still not a hundred percent is going to be able to do against the Ohio State defensive front the wild card here I have no idea what Ohio State is yet it's not just that they're not playing anybody because I've always been allowed, you know, it's not who you play, it's how you play a guy, and they are playing absolutely incredible football. The problem is they haven't give, shown us anything of what we were hoping to see this year because, you know, Chip Kelly comes in as the offensive coordinator, and we're all very excited to see what this Ohio State offense is going to look like, and they are just vanilla as possible on both sides of the ball because they've had to be. So it's like I look back the last season, Michigan played a cupcake non-con schedule. But you knew who Michigan was already. They were doing everything you expect them to do. They were handing off, throwing on third down, and just marching down the field. Ohio State's running like a halfback dive and going 86 yards untouched for touchdowns against these teams they're facing. So it's going to be really interesting to see finally this weekend when Ohio State gets into Big Ten play if they start to debut what this offense is going to look like going forward. So based on what I have seen, I think Ohio State's the better team than Oregon, and we haven't really seen what Ohio State is yet. So that gives me a pretty good feeling about the Buckeyes going forward. I think that Ohio State having so many easy buttons is something that probably should terrify Oregon's defense because there are so many different ways. Tom, to your point, it feels like it's like nothing, 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 65 yards, nothing, nothing, nothing. Long run play, long pass play. Oh, here's a pass that's only going to go two yards, but a Mecca Booker or Jeremiah Smith are going to take it the rest of the way for a touchdown. So when you've got so many different ways to take a, a, semi, a drive that might look like it's dead and then turn it into a touchdown, I mean, that's, it, it is not, um, 
you know, I'm not overwhelmed by Ohio State passing challenges, but man, they uh, they seem to have a lot of different ways to find counters to anything the Ducks might be able to pose. But I like what you said, Tom. Look, they might be a 25 point favorite against Michigan State, but at least they're playing a Big Ten team. I mean, come on. Can we see something? Let's go. All right. Coming up on the other side, we'd like to leave you with one player to watch heading into the weekend. We'll do that next. Back here on the Cover 3 Podcast, live on CBS Sports Network. We like to leave you with the player to watch in the Big Ten going into the weekend. So, Danny, week five in the Big Ten, who do you have your eye on? I'm going to look. I, so when I like to evaluate quarterback play, I like to see how you bounce back, either whether it's a pick six in a game, whether it's a multiple interception game, or whether it's after a loss, which is what Dylan Raiola is trying to do. Now, this should be a game that you're able to waltz in there and you're able to just walk through Purdue. But I went with Dylan Raiola just to kind of see how this team mm. handles some adversity first time of the season. I know a lot of people, myself included, thought they could be undefeated 7-0 and by the time they get to Columbus. But now... How quickly do they deal with the loss, put it behind them, get ready for the next opponent, and dominate that opponent? So I'm watching Dylan Raiola to see how he bounces back after that rough overtime performance. Overall, he was pretty strong against Illinois, but they did lose. I'm curious to see how he bounces back. Dude, that's a great pick. I mean, he made some seriously NFL throws in that ball game uh, and gave Illinois all they wanted until overtime. Speaking of Illinois' defense, I'm going to go ahead and take Penn State tight end Tyler Warren. He's a guy who I think has to be one of the absolute front runners for the Mackey Award. Penn State receivers are still kind of developing. Warren's not developing anymore. He's there. Like he is the guy. I think they'll try to get him early and often on those Illinois linebackers and Illinois safeties and go to him a lot in this ballgame. Yeah, going back to the Rayola pick there, Danny. Here's here's a little nugget for you guys to just process a little bit. Best quarterback in the Big Ten right now? Maybe. Not entirely out of line the way he's playing. Um, my player to watch this weekend, I, I'm going to go to the battle for the little brown jug, a border battle between Michigan and Minnesota. The Gophers are going east. They're heading to Ann Arbor to take on the Wolverines. And we've spent a whole lot of time talking about the Michigan quarterback situation, how bad it's been, how terrible that offense has been, and how great the defense is. But when we talk about that defense, we usually talk about Kenneth Grant, Mason Graham, or Will Johnson, who has two pick sixes. One guy we don't mention nearly as often who we need to start talking about more, Josiah Stewart. Stewart transferred to the Wolverines last year from Coastal Carolina, and he was fine. And a great unit. He made some good plays. He had some good numbers. So far this season, he has been spectacular. He already has six and a half tackles for loss, four sacks, a forced fumble, five QB pressures. The man has been a game wrecker, I think, at home against Minnesota this week. There won't be a letdown. Maybe the offense is still going to struggle, but Josiah Stewart and that Wolverines defense will make sure the Michigan gets away with another win against Minnesota. Sometimes my player to watch is somebody who I know will do really well or think will do really well. In this case, it is a player who I think is an absolute X factor in the matchup because Indiana welcomes Maryland. And statistically, Billy Edwards has had a really good start to the season. Eight touchdowns, two interceptions. He's connected with Ty Felton a lot. That's a really good idea. But we didn't really expect Billy Edwards to even have the QB1 job going into the season. When he was named the starter, we were a little bit concerned. So he He's exceeded the expectations, but now that you're getting into the real thick of Big Ten play, can Billy Edwards be able to keep it up? Can he play well enough to be able to give Maryland a chance to go into Bloomington and compete against an Indiana team that has been absolutely tremendous? So I don't know that Billy Edwards is going to be a star this weekend, but I do know that he will be an absolute X factor in one of the most fascinating matchups throughout the Big Ten schedule well if you like what you got right here you can get us all the time on demand whenever you want we are live mondays wednesdays thursdays 11 a.m eastern time saturday night 11 30 p.m eastern time our locks episode is thursdays at 11 a.m eastern time and of course you can scan that qr code or you can download the cover three podcast wherever you get your podcast